for this presentation is to give you the Japanese efforts in HPC to combat the COVID-19 virus. And we're using our latest supercomputer, Fugaku, as well as other supercomputers that are situated around Japan. I'm Satoshi Matsuoka, director of Weekend RCCS, and uh, I lead one of the efforts uh, on COVID-19. So um, overall, Japan has um, about 13 so-called SPCI resource centers. And these are mostly tier two machines that are situated in various universities. And the tier one machine being the new uh, Fugaku machine that's supplanting the K computer and will become operational sometime uh, early 2021. But what we have done uh, in the light of this crisis due to COVID-19, it was decided the Ministry of Education and Sports, Culture, Science and Technology has decided that we will utilize the supercomputers that are not only available as tier two machines around Japan, but also early deployment of Fugaku, almost a year ahead of schedule to combat COVID-19. So a solicitation has been made and there are two types of programs, one for Fugaku and one for other HPCI tier two machines. But Fugaku one is much more selective and as I will explain later, has yielded uh, many results already with respect to not only areas like drug discoveries, but also mitigation of transmissions of the virus. And the program, both programs have started in April and we have been running this for the past two months. So since this talk will mostly focus on Fugaku, just to give you a very brief overview of Fugaku, we have been designing, building, and facilitating Fugaku for the past 10 years. In fact, the whole Fugaku project started even before this predecessor, K-Computer, became operational. The project started basically in 2010. And there's a series of various stages of the project with the formal approval of actual building the machine in 2014, the first chip camp coming out in 2018, and here we are at ISC, and uh, it just has been announced that Fugaku has become the fastest machine in the world by not just on top 500, but on many metrics and many rankings. And such an uh, achievement had been, had been the, uh, the result of years of collaboration or co-design activities between the entire Japanese application community and Riken and Fugaku team, or sorry, Riken and Fujitsu team, which have been responsible for the actual research design and build of the processor and the machine itself. So this coupling has been very extensive, spanning back to some, sometime around 2012. And this extremely tight collaboration has yielded nine representative areas, or part of or what we call the priority areas, out of which uh, each area picked nine applications, one application each. And the objective of the project, one of the primary objectives of the project was to create a machine that will run up to 100 times faster on these important applications while satisfying the ease of programming. And this performance characteristics as well as the speeds of programming have been critical in attaining this early result in our fight against COVID-19. Because if it takes time to pro program, it takes time to tune your code, then you know, it will not take a lot of time to adapt your code to combat the virus. So here's a chip, A64FX. It's a Fujitsu Recan design chip. And TSMC 7 nanometers has, uh, um, has various um, 48 cores plus uh, up to four consistent cores in the chip. But just looking at this photo diagram really doesn't tell you much. So I'll just give you a very brief um, like 
30,000 feet overview of what the chip is. It is a mini core ARM CPU on one hand, so each core is fully compatible on the 864 bit ARM processor. It's compliant with many stand ARM standards, um, especially for servers. So theoretically, it can run any ARM code, including things like PowerPoint, which I intend to do. Right now, I'm running my PowerPoint on my PC. I want to run PowerPoint on my um, record. So we can just, just do that. So, you know, and as the CPUs are not very weak as had been uh, previous many core processors, but, you know, as it's a decent visual performance. But also, it has characteristics like a GPU. It has very high bandwidth, memory bandwidth, internal bandwidth, uh, interconnect bandwidth, and uh, very wide vectorization. In fact, put it the other way, its memory system and the internal buses are designed to accommodate this enormous bandwidth requirement as uh, facilitated by this uh, very wide vector. So it's almost like a GPU in terms of both characteristics and performance. So you get the best of both worlds. You get a CPU, which is easily programmable, but you get GPU-like performance, especially on high bandwidth code. And we also added some AI enhancement features, just like GPU. So uh, all in all, this chip is great for traditional HPC, as, and in fact, it's fantastic for uh, traditional HPC, but also it's very amenable to new workloads like deep learning. So this is just one data point. You know, you see all these uh, fairly popular uh, open source programs of all varieties uh, of different disciplines. And the benchmarks show that we get about three times the performance per chip compared to mainstream CPUs by other vendors, while the power remaining the same. That is to say that we get three times performance with high steel power, which means that we get three times better energy efficiency. And this is quite remarkable because you know anytime a vendor comes out with a new generation CPU, you get about 20% faster or 20% more efficient. I think this is one of the first time that a new CPU, not, a, not an accelerated GPU, first time a new CPU came out and basically was three times faster than anything else that's offered on that. And what we do is uh, we have um, each, uh, each chip is a single node. So we have 158,976 nodes of this chip assembled into 432 cabinets. So this makes it the largest machine ever created in terms of number of nodes and, and also in terms of footprint and also power consumption and so forth. And of course, performance. So there are lots of numbers that are outlined here. But the important thing is that it not only has very high flops, but also it has extremely high memory bandwidth. It has 163 petabytes of memory bandwidth. And also in reduced precision, it has more than exaflops of performance. So uh, with this balance and also with this uh, high uh, flops ratio, many of the applications we had expected in the exascale era will run at the expected speed that we had envisioned back in, let's say, 10 years ago, when we really started to think about exascale machines. So literally, literally, K is the first of the breed of the exascale supercomputers. It's not an exaflop in double precision, but it demonstrates the, the performance of exascale machines. And of course, in some precision, it's already exaflops. So put this performance context, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the machine is about equivalent to about 20 million smartphones or 300,000 servers, all being running standard software, ARM, um, you know, ARM, Linux, or Windows, and other applications. And 20 million smartphones or 300,000 servers just happen to be the number of units that are shipped annually in Japan. So that means in this edge to cloud world, if you have two Fugakus, yeah, that will satisfy all the computing needs in Japan. So that's the magnitude of the machine that we have built. And from the AI perspective, um, we have already announced that we recorded about 1.4 exaflop in the new HPAL AI benchmark. Um, so this makes it uh, not only 
much faster than all the aggregate AI machines or AI friendly machines in Japan uh, combined, but also uh, the um, much faster in terms of real um, compute performance compared to a uh, machine like Sun, which of course is a great machine for AI, but if you compare in terms of things like HBLI, uh, Fugaku is several times faster. So this makes Fugaku also the fastest AI machine in the world. And again, you know, um, the software is quite standard and it runs all the uh, expected software stacks from uh, your HPC portfolio, but also it runs uh, uh, you know, standard software from other areas like big data, from cloud, from data analytics, from deep learning and, um, and so forth. Object store, um, virtualization has virtualization features, has uh, container features, and uh, everything can be managed by various open source management tools like Spec. And it runs the standard vanilla version of Red Hat anti Linux. You don't require, doesn't require standard Linux. In fact, in the same chip on a Cray machine, YHPE machine, it runs uh, SUSE on the Cray software run. So, you know, it's a very standard software. And again, it makes it very important that the standard software be available in order for our scientists to quickly get on board, get performance, get their code running, get performance, and then tackle this difficult COVID-19 problem. And um, it's installed, the whole machine's been installed in May, um, May 13th. And then the, of course, there are a lot of still development going on, uh, and tuning going on, but, uh, by the way, the machine will be available to the entire world. The researchers, not just the Japanese researchers, once it comes online fully early 2021. So COVID-19. So um, as I said, uh, there is the uh, Furaku program uh, to fight against COVID-19. And the uh, Furaku resources were made available a year ahead of general production. And there are more uh, research topics that are solic being solicited for international um, in fact, internationally. So if you have any good ideas, please contact, you know, go, go to the website. Um, you can do the Google search, go to the website, and uh, you can apply. Um, and currently, there are five areas. Of course, we have very stringent, uh, fairly stringent standards. Um, they not only have to be applications that are solve the problem, they have to work with us, work with us with weekend and, and, and the, the ministry extensively. Um, so that puts a, a little bit of a high bar, but the, all these scientists have, have been very satisfied with the mission. But uh, they're largely divided into two areas. One is uh, medical pharma. So you are trying to find, uh, trying to see what the virus, how the virus behaves, what are the effective drugs, especially how can we repurpose existing drugs and so forth. And um, also how vaccines may be effective and all that. So these are molecular level uh, investigation of the virus and the, its, um, uh, its countermeasures. The other is more macroscopic. So we're trying to see how these uh, viruses are transmitted and what are the mitigation measures and how it will impact, how it will impact the society. So um, uh, as we'll explain later, this has, uh, the latter has also received considerable attention in Japan. In fact, it's been all news sites in fact, it's being um, uh, deployed to, uh, uh, it's being uh, heavily considered to be deployed to establish public policies uh, against um, this, the spread of the coronavirus. So firstly, molecular, um, uh, you know, pharmaceutical molecular investigation. So Yuji uh, Sugita, um, one of the um, PIs here, uh, he's a weekend scientist, uh, so he's doing significant, uh, he has his own a very extremely scalable uh, molecular dynamics code uh, called Genesis, which has been developed on K and Fugaku. So this code is very, very, very scalable. It scales to you know, tens of and hundreds of thousands you know, uh, of uh, processors on Fugaku. And uh, what he's been doing is to investigate um, how the, uh, the structure within the virus that would uh, attach to the uh, the cells, you know, the human cells, um, this uh, this target, how um, it modifies itself dynamically to have, to have this attachment, uh, uh, in particular this S protein on the surface coronavirus, 
And uh, the, 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 it's been a cryo what, uh, EM, uh, microscope, what the microscope has been able to detect the two uh, snapshots of the, of the virus, this section of the virus, which is uh, consists of many proteins. Um, before, but basically, they are before and after. Before, when the, when it's closed, and after when it's open, and when it's open is when the when it attaches to the human target, human cell target. Uh, so Suita-san has been deploying uh, his Genesis code to basically trying to determine the exact process by transitional by which this transitional transition from this closed uh, state to the open state happens. And what are the energy? Uh, what are the energy levels involved? And this is a great segue into investigating exactly how this mechanism works. And if you can find ways to mitigate this, that is to prevent the opening of this uh, uh, proteomic uh, arm, so to speak, may allow us to um, pre um, create uh, various drugs or sort of uh, pattern measures like drugs and vaccines in order to prevent the uh, spread of the uh, coronavirus. So um, given such structural investigation, even more detailed um, investigation being done at the molecular orbital level or the first principles uh, uh, calculations uh, of the coronavirus target. And but this is being done um, with using uh, what's called FMO, which is extremely fragmented molecular orbital calculation, which is an extremely scalable way to calculate uh, the basic Schrodinger's equations. Um, and this scales actually to uh, tens to 100,000 CPUs on Faraku. So, um, so what they've been doing is to basically try to, um, again, investigate uh, the energy levels of spike protein, but, um, but in a much more detailed fashion as compared to what can be done with molecular dynamics. And again, this is allowing this, um, them to uh, trying to see what are, you know, what happened, what, what are the energy levels, involved in energy levels, and how it's, uh, why it attracts to these spike proteins are attracted and attached to the human cells, trying to investigate this exact mechanism of doing so. On the K computer, this will, this calculation would have taken, you know, week, days, weeks, multi weeks. But on the Furaku, this calculation, if you run this on, you know, they have run this to up to 3,070 nodes, and this is almost, if, um, this is almost um, uh, 150,000 cores. And they have been able to do this in just uh, three hours. So this kind of speed allows them to do investigational research in a very rapid way. And this is running more than 100 times faster than on the K computer. And, uh, and you know, this, uh, this groundbreaking uh, speed they're experiencing is allowing them to do many investigative measures in order to allow for um, these mechanisms to be very precisely modeled. Again, to uh, allow us to find discover new drugs and vaccines. And this is a team of people doing that. Uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Okuno at uh, Ikan and Kyoto University, uh, again, he's doing molecular dynamics uh, investigation to try to do weak target to drugs, uh, try to do, uh, uh, try to take 2,000 or so existing drugs and see how they may attach to these uh, uh, with, uh, targets like spike proteins um, in a very, very exhaustive fashion. But he's trying to do it in a, uh, again in a, although it's molecular dynamics, uh, uh, previously these types of uh, very sweeping investigation have done on a much, I would say, more coarse grain methods. But he's using, basically using uh, molecular dynamics, which is much finer grain method, which is, but which is much, much more accurate, but much, much more computationally expensive. But with the power of Fugaku, he's been able to do so. And he is finding, uh, he has some early discoveries saying that some of the target drugs that are um, found to be effective, uh, possibly effective, uh, like Avigan, that's been, that's an antiviral, anti-flu drug uh, that stopped power to can, which was said to be effective, um, may actually be so. So it's getting uh, confirmational uh, 
um, evidences that this may be an effective measure. So, uh, but you know, there are other uh, more macroscopic simulations, as I mentioned. So, uh, Riken RCCS Tsubokura-san has been uh, running CFD, very accurate simulations, CFD simulations of dispersion of virus droplets. So this is a CFD, but he's doing it in a very, very accurate way. So either the droplets are modeled with water, and as they go through uh, the air, they evaporate. And he can do this because he's been modeling fuel injection systems on cars uh, using high-performance computing for a long time. And uh, basically, he's applying his technology to do very, very accurate simulations of uh, droplet dispersion when people cough or talk, or you know, when we're in a train, you have a vast number of people how you may be able to mitigate this by, let's say, opening a window and getting the air to be replaced and so forth. So it's a very, very expensive simulation, but only, again, only possible to a doctor. And this is very important because people, for example, worry that uh, big cities have trains. And that, you know, people worry whether um, you, know, you get infectious, um, uh, train can become a source of a cluster of uh, infections and what are the mitigation procedures. Is it best to open the door windows? But in summertime, is the heat and the when the temperature is high, um, you know, it's um, it's hard to open a window because of air conditioning. So, what's the best way of mitigation? Do you open the door partially, or opening the doors and the stations are the effective measures to again to basically let the air circulate? So, there are many many questions that need to be answered, and this is applicable to trains. Um, is also applied to many other scenarios like uh, how how masks uh, may uh, how wearing or not wearing masks and how whether wearing tight fitting masks or loose fitting masks may be uh, effective. So um, he's finding that you know without a mask, obviously you need to keep your social distance, but with a very tightly coupled mask, you may not need to. Uh, you know, people are putting up partitions um, on the desks uh, in offices and restaurants. What are, but how high do you need these uh, partitions to be? And, uh, and he's finding that, of course, with no partition, uh, the uh, person sitting opposite to you will get be bombarded with these droplets and the aerosols. Uh, but with low, low partition, um, uh, you get the droplets will not come to you, will not uh, penetrate to you, but you get, still get quite a number of, amount of aerosols. And the, um, but when you have air uh, partition that's uh, only 20 centimeters higher, that will all, almost go to the top of your head, then most of the, uh, these aerosols will be blocked. And also, you know, uh, people sitting next to you will not be affected. So, you know, something like this is uh, very important for um, devising countermeasures, and the, the Japanese government and the anti COVID uh, uh, if organizations within the government are paying extremely high attention to this, and this has been on TV coverage and so forth. And of course, you want to model the entire office space, the ventilations with the air conditioning, um, and what's the most effective measures? Do you put on put in ventilators? Do you open the windows, etc.? And again, these are you know the guidelines you need in order to mitigate this uh, transmission. But these need very detailed simulations, not just with the aerosols, with the evaporation, but with heat uh, elements and so forth. So, so like Fugaku, you need the power of a very large supercomputer like Fugaku. But also, this need these need to be easily programmable because you need to simulate various uh, um, various various things. Finally, um, uh, Nobuya Ito, um, uh, a weekend, and uh, his team at various universities and institutions are trying to do social simulations. Um, he's trying to answer questions, for example, what happens if um, people have uh, contact tracing applications? What's the percentage? What's the most effective way of mitigation given the certain percentages? How much, what percentage of people need to have this contact tracing application or be effective? How many days? Uh, what are the delay factors involved? And so, you know, again, there are many parameters, and we're trying to do an agent-based simulation to basically again try to help these establishment policies, um, and also to motivate people to actually uh, utilize these applications in order to form mitigation. And he has many, many results, and he's getting more and more suggestions from this uh, from the experts as to 
uh, uh, how much, you know, what are the new parameters, what needs to be stimulated, and so forth. So there are um, days after symp symptomatic to alert, alert target days. Um, for obviously shorter to better suppression, isolating days after getting an alert, effective asymptotic infected agent contact. You know, this had also been quite a bit of challenge, and uh, he's got some really great and good, very good results here. And also, um, he's also um, his team is also trying to do economic simulations. Uh, how what how these um, measures will affect. Economy. So this team is also doing extensive economic simulations in order to see what policies, how these um, uh, things like lockdown or this uh, self isolation will affect the economy and how the immune can mitigate this. So all in all, um, it's been very um, so Fugaku has been very productive, and um, the uh, Japanese. Um, um, public at large is now very aware because it's been these results have been on news shows in the past week and we're getting fantastic responses and hopefully we can share these results and also collaborate with uh, international parties for even further investigation so that we can resolve this COVID-19 crisis at various levels of the society. Thank you very much.